in a straight east-west direction, whereas meridional winds travel in a straight north and south direction. Now that's all well and good in the upper atmosphere. In the upper atmosphere, the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force are doing this never-ending tug of war. However, at the surface of the Earth, in the lowest 1,000 meters of the atmosphere, and I'll have that written down here in a second, in the lowest 1,000 meters of the atmosphere, we begin to experience a new force. And here's why. The surface of the Earth is jagged. We have trees, we have mountains, we have buildings, we have people, we have cars, we have all kinds of stuff here on the surface of the Earth. And it behaves the same way that bristles in a carpet or a really thick grass on a golf ball behaves. It acts to slow the wind down. And this force is what's called the friction force. So here in the lowest layer of the atmosphere, in the lowest 1,000 meters, friction begins to slow the wind down, throwing off the balance between the pressure gradient and the Coriolis force. Make sure you remember that. The pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force are thrown off balance in the lowest layer of the atmosphere. And this happens in the lowest 1,000 meters of the atmosphere. Make sure you know that number, the lowest 1,000 meters in the atmosphere. And this layer is called the planetary boundary layer. And now that you've thrown friction into the mix, the wind behaves completely differently in the lowest layer of the atmosphere. And in fact, there are whole courses just devoted to studying the motion of the air in that lowest 1,000 layers, or sorry, in that lowest 1,000 meters. It's what's called the planetary boundary layer. There are whole courses just devoted to it. But let's actually talk about what's happening. So in the upper atmosphere, we have our particle of air. I'm up on the upper right hand portion of the slide right now. We have our particle of air and it's traveling straight. All right, and let me just put a north line and the pressure gradient force is pulling to the north. Let's say we have a low pressure up there. The Coriolis force is directing the wind to the south and everything is good. The two are balanced out. We're in geostrophic balance. Everything looks beautiful. However, in the lower portion of the atmosphere, in comes friction. Friction is always directed behind, in the opposite direction behind the particle. So if the particle is traveling straight, in this case the particle is traveling to the east, friction is directed to the west. It's directed to the back of the particle. It's, pull, it's like it's pulling on the back of the particle. Let's say you were walking and I was standing behind you pulling on your shirt. That's essentially what friction is doing to the particle of air. Now because of this, the wind begins to slow down. Now if you recall our discussion on the pressure gradient force, the two things that determine the pressure gradient force are difference and distance. Neither one of those things have anything to do with speed. So the pressure gradient force does not change in this situation. However, what does change is the Coriolis force, because remember, the Coriolis force is determined by the speed of the wind, the latitude, and the scale of the motion. Well, friction has just slowed down the wind, so the Coriolis force is now weaker. And let me take my little eraser right here, and we now have a weaker Coriolis force. So now friction has slowed the wind down. We now have a weak Coriolis force. And so now the net force acting on the wind, 
the net force acting on the wind is now directed, and let me use green for that, the net force acting on the wind is now directed upwards. Why? Because friction has slowed the wind down, and now the net force acting on the wind is upwards. The pressure gradient force is now stronger than the Coriolis force. What that causes? That causes the wind to begin to turn into the wind begins to turn into the low pressure. And it actually does so, let's suppose we have some isobars here. It actually does so at a 30 degree angle. So it actually turns into the wind at a 30 degree angle. Now I'm not as, as stressed about that. I just want you to know that at the surface, winds turn into low pressure and they turn away from high pressure. Now throwing this back into our discussion on clockwise, counterclockwise, cyclonic flow, anticyclonic flow, throwing it all in, this is what you get in the northern hemisphere. At the surface, so in that lowest 1,000 meters, winds rotate clockwise and out of high pressure and counterclockwise and into low pressure. So winds are actually traveling away from high pressure. That's what we call divergence. Winds are traveling into low pressure. That's what we call convergence. And it's those two things, divergence from high pressure, convergence from low pressure, that actually gives us all of that interesting weather that I love talking about. And we'll talk about that in a second. But before we do, one thing I want to mention is in the Southern Hemisphere, winds still spiral out of high pressure and they still spiral into low pressure. Why? Because the pressure gradient force does not change in the Southern Hemisphere. It's always high to low. Always, always, always high to low. But the Coriolis force is now turning in the opposite direction. So in the Southern Hemisphere, winds rotate counterclockwise and out of high pressure, clockwise and into low pressure. So if you're gonna take anything away from this and make sure you write this down, cyclonic motion is around a low pressure system. At the surface, it's counterclockwise and into in the northern hemisphere clockwise and out of or that clockwise and into in the southern hemisphere sorry anticyclonic motion is around a high pressure system in the northern hemisphere it's clockwise and out of high pressure in the southern hemisphere it's counterclockwise and out of high pressure so the only thing that changes in the Southern Hemisphere is the Coriolis force. Now the last thing I want to talk about about high pressure and low pressure is the concepts of divergence and convergence. So what actually happens is when winds are flowing into low pressure, that is called convergence. Now think about what would happen if Let's say you're at an intersection and cars are coming in all directions towards the center of that intersection. And let's imagine there's no red light, green light, stop sign, nothing. They all just converge at the center of that intersection. You're going to get a pile up. You're going to get a car pile up. Well, the same thing happens in the atmosphere. When wind converges, when air converges at a low pressure system, that air piles up. It then travels, it then rises higher up into the atmosphere. And this rising then causes air to cool and condense, forming clouds and forming rain. 
Then once the air reaches the tropopause, that's the top of the troposphere, it diverges outward. This is how we get rain. This is how we get storm systems. So areas of low pressure are stormy because there's lots of rising air. On the other hand, air is diverging away from high pressure. Air is traveling away from high pressure. That then leaves a void. And something has to come in and fill that void. Well, the something is air from higher up. It sinks down to the surface where it then spreads out again. So in high pressure, we have sinking air. And the sinking air causes compression, heating, drying. And so in high pressure, you get very clear weather. You get very clear skies. And you don't really get rain around high pressure. So you get rain around low pressure, but not so much around high pressure. And it's because the idea that air converges and rises in low pressure, and it sinks and diverges in high pressure. So this is how low and high pressure systems act as weather makers. So now not only have you learned about the wind, but you've also learned about the role that high and low pressures play in our weather. That's pretty cool if you ask me. Sorry, I'm nerding out. The last thing I'm going to talk about in this module, we are just a few slides away from finishing up, is wind direction and measuring the wind. So as meteorologists, we actually don't care about what direction the wind is heading towards. Normally, as humans, we always think about wind in terms of where it's heading, right? Or we usually think about our direction in terms of where we're heading. Like if I'm driving to downtown San Jose, I'm going to tell my friends, hey, I'm driving to downtown San Jose. I wouldn't tell them, oh, hey, I'm coming from Cupertino. No, I tell them where I'm heading towards. Well, meteorologists are a little weird with this. We actually do things opposite. We talk about where the wind is coming from. And the reason why we do that is because where the wind is coming from gives us a lot of information about what the wind may be carrying. For example, if the wind is coming from the ocean, it's likely going to be bringing cool, moist air with it. On the other hand, if the wind is coming from the desert, it's likely going to be bringing hot, dry air from, with it. That's why we care about where the wind is coming from. And as meteorologists, rather than actually using north, east, south, west, we usually use wind in degrees. And 360 degrees, that's the top of a compass. That represents north. That means that the wind is coming from the north. 90 degrees, that represents wind coming from the east. 180 degrees, wind coming from the south. 270 degrees, wind coming from the west. And then some combination of north and west. If it's more west than north, we call that west-northwest. If they're equal, just about as far from the north as from the west, that's called northwest. If it's more from the north than the west, that's called north-northwest. Um, you'll see these terms a little bit in this week's module, but I'm not going to make you really worry too much about the degrees. I just want you to know northwest, northwest, northeast, northeast, and so on. A few more things I want to talk about in terms of wind direction. Um, if you've ever watched the news before, you may have heard a weather forecaster say, well, today we've got a strong onshore flow, and so we're going to have some fog coming in, and temperatures are going to be cool. Or they might say, well, today we have a strong offshore flow, and so it's going to be hot and dry. Well, what do those terms mean? Well, they're kind of slang in meteorology, but here's what they mean. An onshore wind means wind is coming from the ocean onshore. On the other hand, offshore wind, offshore flow, means that wind is coming from the land offshore. So when you hear onshore, think of wind coming from the ocean. When you hear offshore, think of wind coming from the land. So onshore coming from the ocean, offshore coming from the land.
in some locations, wind doesn't really change direction too much. You don't have offshore one day, onshore another day. Instead, you could be at a region where the wind is blowing in the same direction almost constantly. This is what's called a prevailing wind, and it can actually create some pretty interesting consequences, such as the growth of trees. In cases where the prevailing wind is always pointed in the same direction, all the branches and leaves on these trees will point in that, that same direction, almost like a giant series of wind socks, which I'll show you a wind sock in a moment. Now, how do we actually measure wind? Well, as meteorologists, we want to know what the wind speed is outside because we want to be able to tell you, hey, you might want to, um, you might want to wear something a little bit tighter, not none as loose today because it's really windy outside. Well, we want to measure the wind. We also want to be able to enter those conditions into weather models and get a really good idea of such things such as the strength of a hurricane or how damaging the wind could be. And the way we do this is we use an instrument called an anemometer. And an anemometer works by measuring the wind. And there are many different ways that an anemometer can measure the wind. And I'll show you some in a moment. And then there are wind socks. Those give you a more qualitative visual look. If you don't want to look at a specific number, you just want to know just the general, how strong is the wind blowing. Wind socks are very useful, and they're very useful for pilots. And then wind vanes can actually give you the wind direction. So here's an anemometer. This is called a cup anemometer. And the way that this works is the wind is coming from one particular direction, and it's blowing into the cup. Now, the stronger the wind is blowing, the faster the cups will move. And then that information, the rotation of these cups, is then fed into this little computer, which then calculates a wind speed. Now, these can't tell you the direction of the wind. They can only tell you the speed of the wind. Why? Because if the wind is coming from the south and it's blowing into this cup, this cup's then going to push a little bit. This next cup's going to come in. If the cup's coming, or if the wind's coming from the west, it'll blow this cup first. Um, but it really can't give us any information on where the wind is blowing from. Here's another anemometer, and this one actually does have the ability to give us both the direction and the speed. This is what's called a propeller anemometer. And what this is using is a propeller at the front, kind of like the propeller of a plane, is spinning faster depending on the wind speed. But what we also have back here is pivoted to this anemometer is a tail. And that tail is pointing in the direction that the wind is heading towards. And then that can then be calibrated into the direction that the wind is coming from. And this little box right here, this little box actually points due south. And so this then tells us what direction the wind is blowing compared to from the south. In this case, because the tail is pointing this way, this represents a north wind. Winds are coming this way, they're blowing into the propeller, and they're pointing this wind vane towards the south. So this represents a wind that's blowing from the north to the south. Here's another wind vane. This one doesn't have any kind of anemometer attached to it, so it only gives us the wind direction, not so much the wind speed. Here is a wind sock. And again, these are used at airports. And the idea here is that it gives you wind direction automatically. But it also gives you, oops, sorry about that, it also gives you wind speed. And the way it works is the more the, more the sock sticks out, the more inflated the sock, the sock is, the faster the wind. If only half the sock is inflated, that's, that represents a weaker wind than if the whole sock is inflated. And then my favorite wind sock is called the Wyoming wind sock. And this basically tells you the higher, or, or the, um, the more the sock is st sticking out, the faster the wind, the, the, 
higher up the chain is, is sticking out, the faster the wind. If it's zero, that would be a case where the sock is pointing straight down. It's broken. Notify meteorologist. 30 degrees, fresh breeze, 45, gentle zephyr, 60, hurricane in the area, 75, beware of low-flying trains, that'd be awesome, and 90, welcome to big, wonderful Wyoming. Now, obviously, this is a joke, but, again, it can tell us how fast the wind is blowing. So, that's it for Module 5. Um, just to review real quick, um, pressure is based on the weight of the air above you. Average sea level pressure, 1,013.25 millibars, or 29.92 inches of mercury. Know both numbers. Feel good with both numbers. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure. That's called the, um, that's due to the pressure gradient force, and that is, that is caused by, well, the pressure gradient force is caused by imbalance. And then there are actually three forces, sorry, let me... Cross that out here. There are three forces, not four, there are three forces that affect the wind. The pressure gradient force, the Coriolis force, and friction. That's it for module five. Um, make sure that you feel comfortable with this material before